Well, Pastor Rod's had his, uh, Rob has, uh, you're Rob, I'm right. Pastor <laughs> Rob has had us in the Old Testament for quite some time now, so we're going to go to the uh, New Testament and uh, to the last two chapters of that. Now, like many of you, I'm finding the challenges of life to be very, very challenging. And there are those of us here this morning who are facing discouragement, facing loneliness, depression, financial worries, financial loss. There are those with serious health issues. Isn't it amazing as we pray together every Sunday morning? Uh, just the, the critical health issues that we're continually praying for. Uh, there are some in our church family just this week who have lost loved ones. And uh, some of you are fer- facing uh, mar- marital issues. Uh, the challenges of raising children. And uh, you're maybe looking for the day when you can send one, as y- one of yours off, as, as the McNutts have uh, just this past week. So... Uh, And then you got news from our community uh, that that is so heartbreaking. And and news from around the world uh, that is very scary, is it not? Very scary. So we must increasingly obey the command of Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, to set our minds, to set our affections upon those things which are above and not upon the things of this world. The Bible is not saying we should do this in order to escape from our circumstances, but it's saying do this so that when you look upon the face of God, then you can look at your circumstances through His perspective and deal with them accordingly so that they don't defeat us as Christians. We're going to set our minds this morning on the New Jerusalem. That is yet to come. The Jerusalem that John the Apostle saw in the last two books of Revelation. But before we, or the last two chapters, uh, chapters uh, 21 and 22, uh, but before we go there, I would like to take you on a very, very brief trip uh, to the Jerusalem that is still on this earth. A few years ago, for the first time in my life, I had the the opportunity to go to Israel and uh, spend about 10 days there. And uh, by the way, you have the opportunity to do the same. A little commercial here. Sasif Bible Church is uh, joining a tour group to go to Israel uh, next year, March, April time frame. Uh, So if you're interested, pray about that. Uh, It is an unbelievable, and as you've heard before, and I will say again, a life-changing experience if you can do that. Maybe you think I can't pray about it, but uh, or contact uh, SASIF church office there or go onto their website, uh, www.sasif.org, and uh, get details about that. There are still openings. But uh, en- enough of the cur- commercial break. Let's go back to our regular programming here. Several years ago, I was walking through the streets of Old Jerusalem, and I say Old Jerusalem because the the Jerusalem that is today, at least the old section, dates back uh, to the time of Joshua, Uh, back as early as 1400 B.C. And then, of course, 400 years after that, David uh, reigned as king in Jerusalem, over the tribes, and uh, he made Jerusalem the center of his kingdom. And it became known as the city of David, as we see a portion of the old city here to the right of the screen, uh, still enclosed by the ancient city walls. One day as we were walking within these walls, our Israeli guide took us underground beneath the mount where Herod's temple once stood in the time of Jesus. And here you will see our guide, Tito. He's looking at what appears to be just a big block wall. And what you see here, he is explaining the amazing story of this huge carved foundation stone. 
This stone is at bedrock level, sitting under the Temple Mount. It is the largest foundation stone yet to be excavated under the Temple Mount. It weighs an estimated 500 metric tons. That's equal to 1,120,000 pounds. One foundation stone. How did they get it there, Herod's workers? No one real. How did they build the pyramid? They still don't know. How just the manpower and, and, and the tools that they were able to make at that time could move such huge stones. And then as we walked the streets of the old city, there was a sense of security. But the presence of armed guards with their M16s or whatever they had betrayed that that, that sense of security was a false sense of security. And as you look at these two, uh, can you guess by chance which one is the George Clooney lookalike? You're going to hurt my feelings laughing like that. <laughs> well, anyhow, Jews and Muslims, Christians seem to be living relative peaceful uh, lives together. And, and you see the, the mingling as we walk up the market area of the Via Dolorosa. The night skyline of the old city is beautiful with the dome of rock there in the center shining like a gold nugget, and, and yet it is very dark spiritually. The spiritual darkness of the old city was driven home to me when I had approached the western wall of old Jerusalem, and that's the Wailing Wall, of course, and uh, it, it is the only wall still standing, uh, the, the only portion of the wall of the Temple Mount still standing. And... This is where uh, Jews, Christians alike, go to pray. You've got to go there when you visit Jerusalem. But as I was standing there and, and just touching the wall, just still pinching myself as well, uh, am I really here? And a, a, a Orthodox Jewish man approached me in his Jewish garb, and, and he asked me if I would like for him to pray for me and my family. And I said, well... He caught me off guard, but I said, sure, sure. So we bowed our heads and prayed, and, and, and the spiritual darkness just hit me in the face when after he prayed, he opened up his hand toward me, and there was a dollar bill there, and I realized what he wanted was another dollar bill from another tourist because he had prayed for me. So the spiritual darkness in old Jerusalem is, is very real there. And beyond the old city walls, a big, modern, and busy metropolis has spread out toward the west. This is the modern Jerusalem. And it has inhabitants of uh, well over one million people. It's a city of wealth, of technology, of high-rise apartment buildings, business buildings. It's a city which has tried and rejected Starbucks coffee. Can you imagine that? It just is not strong enough, which I cannot understand. Like the old city, the new section of the city can also give the false impression that its inhabitants are living in peaceful coexistence. For example, one night as we were shopping in the busy Ben Yehuda shopping center area, a lady had put her large harp right out in the middle of the mezzanine there, and she had rolled it there with, you see, the, the hand cart. And she's kind of wrapped in a blanket, but she was peacefully playing this harp, and I was just standing there enjoying that. And uh, a lot of people around, but then I learned a bit later that that lady was only like a block or two away from a pizza hut. Some of you will remember, Sabaru's Pizza Hut, where a terrorist bomber, had gone in and blown himself up a year or two before this took place and blew up a lot of people with him. So that sense of false security, you know, it, it is always there and always will be until the Prince of Peace comes. And <clears throat> this uh, city of Jerusalem gives the false impression that it is a strong city, almost as if it's a fortress, especially because all of its buildings must be built with a special stone. 
or at least the facade must have this, what they call Jerusalem stone. It's a limestone that since ancient times have been, has been uh, quarried there in the environs of Jerusalem. And when the British turned over that uh, state to Israel back in 1948 and it gained its statehood, the British mandated that all of the buildings be built with or at least be uh, facaded with this Jerusalem stone. And so when the, the sun is shining uh, on Jerusalem, as you see here, either sunrise or sunset, that cream-colored stone just uh, kind of glows in the sunset and uh, with a beautiful golden hue about it. And so the name Jerusalem the Golden. What I have shared with you so far is, is just a glimpse of the Jerusalem that is. But what about the Jerusalem that is to come? Now just as we have had a look uh, into God's Word for the origin of the origin of the old Jerusalem, we have to look into God's Word too uh, for the origin of the Jerusalem that is to come. And of course, none of us have seen that Jerusalem yet, um, with the exception of, of one man, and that's the Apostle John. And uh, he's the one who penned the last two uh, chapters in the Bible, that book of Revelation, where he describes the new Jerusalem which he saw. And uh, Let's read from John's description, if you'll turn with me. Uh, I'm reading from the NIV, and that's, I think, the uh, version of the Pew Bible in front of you, if you uh, forgot your Bible this morning. But in chapter 21, <clears throat> now hold your finger there, and I just want to bring us up to date as to, uh, very quickly, the main events that are yet to take place uh, before this takes place, before chapter 21 takes place. The next great prophetic event, I believe, according to the Word of God, is going to be the rapture of the church, which is when the church saints from Pentecost until the rapture uh, have lived. Uh, many have died. Some will still be living when Jesus returns uh, in the sky and he will rapture the church. He will take, the way, take away the church uh, into heaven uh, forever to be with him. After the rapture, there will be a seven-year pe uh, period upon this earth called the tribulation period. The first half of that tribulation period, the Antichrist will arise. The second half of that tribulation period, it is going to uh, be hell on earth because that is where all the judgments of Revelation that you would read in the earlier chapters of Revelation rain down upon this earth as God judge, judges this ungodly world and through that judgment seeks to bring more people to faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's particularly a time of judgment for Israel who at the end of that seven year period as a nation will see their Messiah come back to this earth and as a nation, they will then profess Him to be their Messiah, which they refused to do at His first coming. Jesus then will establish His kingdom upon earth, the millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year kingdom. He will reign upon earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. At the beginning of that temple, the New temple of Jerusalem will be built as described in Ezekiel's prophecy. That will be the temple from which the Messiah reigns over the whole world. At the end of that 1,000 year period, during which Satan will have been bound in the abyss, he will be loosed for a final struggle, and that final struggle will result in his total defeat and all of the heathen armies of the world who, who over those thousand years will have begun to once again try to come against Christ. They will be destroyed, cast into the lake of fire. Then will be the great white throne judgment at which time all unbelievers will stand before God in judgment, will be cast into the lake of fire as well for eternity. After that, 
God will then destroy the present physical universe, the present earth, will create a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Amen? And those of us who have loved Him as our Savior and Lord will live and reign with Him forever and ever. That's just a bird's eye view of a lot that is going to happen in the years ahead. So let's join the Apostle John as he was receiving these revelations from God about the New Jerusalem while he was exiled on the island of Patmos in the first century. We join, the, uh, we join John as, as an angel is showing him the holy city. Reading verses 1 and 2 of chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I believe this city which John saw in, in this vision uh, in the past is going to be a, a literal, hands-on city in the future. I think there is no good reason to believe otherwise. As we get a little further into this, we're going to see that this city is described in great detail. If it was an imaginary city, that wouldn't be true. But it's described as a literal city. Also, Dr. Alcorn, who wrote a book entitled Heaven, said this, After all, where do we expect physically resurrected people to live if not in a physical environment? Common sense. I believe also that in the New Jerusalem and the New Earth that are the main components uh, making up the New Heaven, that... Uh, the new heaven will, will consist more, of, more, than, of, more than just the, the new Jerusalem and the new earth, but I think those two components will make up uh, primarily the new heaven. What was the first thing to catch John's attention here? I wonder if it was the statement in verse 1 that we read. There was no longer any sea. You know, I have to admit, when I read that, I get a little sad because I like the sea. I like the water. I was just down along the, the water here the other day with my daughter catching fish, and we're not going to tell you where that was. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, I like the water, and it makes me a little sad. No more. For those of you who, who are, are the sand and surf people, and you're thinking, Rod, I, I thought you were going to encourage me with this message. Man, this is sad. No, 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 no salt water. No ocean cities? Come on. Well, evidently not. You, you know, today, three-fourths of the earth is covered by water. At least that's what my science geogra geography teacher, somebody told me. Uh, and so it, it has, to a large degree, uh, it, it's water-based. Uh, however, in the new heaven and new earth, there will be new climatic conditions, and uh, I think there will be new weekend and vacation getaways. You know, so I think we'll get over it pretty quick. In verses 9 and 11, we see the first thing, really, to catch John's attention. Verse 9 reads, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you, you the bride and the wife of the bride. Now, it mentions the seven bowls here, the seven last plagues. Uh, those judgments have already taken place. They, those were bowls and plagues of judgment. They're past now, but this is one of the angels who is still ministering um, and, and revealing things to John. And verse 10 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, that is, carried John away, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. 
So we see here, according to verse 11, what, what catches John's attention immediately is that this city has the glory of God. Now, while in Israel we visited site after site of ancient cities that were built to the glory of man, M many of them were at least, kings or whoever, and one of them, the city of Dan, dates back to the time of Abraham. So it dates back to like 1800 B.C. All of these ancient cities, or at least most of them, lie in ruins today. Or else subsequent civilizations have been built on top of them. That's happened to Jerusalem as well. Layer after layer of civilization. Abraham understood the fading glory of man's cities. In Hebrews 11, we're told that by faith Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is who? God. Almost 4,000 years ago, Abraham was looking for the same city that John saw here in Revelation in the future. And this city having the glory of God, that's what Abraham was looking for. A city having the glory of God and its architect and builder is God. The city's light also caught John's attention according to verse 11. It's brilliance. The city is referred to in verse 9 as the bride, the Lamb's wife. We all have seen the light that radiates from a young bride's eyes, right? Particularly as they walk through the doors and approach the altar where the groom stands. And, uh, by the way, yesterday I celebrated my 39th year of seeing that Radiating look from my bride's face. And I love you, dear. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing like putting someone on the spot. But all believers, you know, all believers gathered in the New Jerusalem on this future day will come to meet Christ, our bridegroom. And that will be the final ceremony of redemptive history. Wow. As the song goes, I can only imagine. What a wedding. What will the wall, the foundations, the gates of the New Jerusalem be like? Let's read verses 12 through 14 to find out. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now drop down to verse 17. He measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper. Hmm. No Jerusalem stone mentioned here. And the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh chastened, and the twelfth amethyst. You didn't think I could do it, did you? The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. I can only imagine. A city's wall is for security, as are its gates. The wall of the city of Old Jerusalem, which I walked around, is high and is thick. It, it, uh, at the top of the wall, its width uh, can handle two chariots uh, traveling abreast. And uh, 
that, that city wall, however, has been breached many times. And although the walls of the New Jerusalem will never be attacked, they will display the glory of God and its awesome structure will remind us of God's might and commitment to protect His people. The guardian angel as at each gate will remind us of the same thing. According to verse 25, the gates shall never be shut. All of the saints will have access to the New Jerusalem based on the blood of the Lamb. According to verse 12, the 12 gates bear the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. This is important, I think. The gates bear the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. According to verse 14, the 12 foundations supporting the wall of the city bear the names of the 12 apostles of the church. Now with these names, the names of the tribes of Israel and the apostles of the church, the distinction between Israel and church will be maintained throughout eternity and both will be in the city reigning together with Christ forever and ever. I think this kind of shoots a big hole in the replacement theology where there are those who are teaching that the church has replaced Israel and shall ever have done so. Here we see the distinction still in the eternal New Jerusalem. And God has a reason for that. And we need to respect it. According to verse 17, the wall of the city is 144 cubits thick, or 216 feet thick. The New Jerusalem's foundations, its walls, its gates, streets, will be constructed and adorned with very different kinds of precious stones, pearls, gold. Now these may all have symbolic meaning. But I think, suffice it to say, the New Jerusalem will be the crown jewel of heaven. And it will be our home. How big will the city be? Let's read verses 15 and 16. The angel who talked to me and uh, had a measuring rod. Anyhow, the city was laid out in a square. It was long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. It, it sounds like it's probably in the shape of a cube. Now, according to these measurements, the city um, is square, 1,400 miles in length, width and height. 1,400 miles. There is no reason to believe that this is not its literal size. Uh, you say, well, could God create such a city? Uh, you know, if man can somehow move into place a foundation stone of over one million pounds, if the Egyptians in ancient times could build the kind of uh, structures they built with those huge stones in the pyramids, uh, cannot God do this? Certainly, he can. The size of the city's foundation would favor the position that the city actually sits upon the new earth rather than hangs suspended sort of above it, as some would think. But we're not going to worry about that. Now, to bring this size into perspective, a mega metropolis of this size in the middle of the U.S. would cover the ground space, it would have a footprint from Canada, sorry, Rob doesn't include Canada, from Canada down to Mexico and from the Appalachian Mountains west to the eastern border of California. That's the footprint of this city. And that's just at the ground level. What if this city has multiple levels? If so, assuming it is the shape of a cube and allowing a generous 12-foot per story for the tall guys, 
it could have over 600,000 stories. Now, I think that's probably plenty of room for all of the redeemed. And interestingly, today in Jerusalem, if you go to the new city area, a high-rise apartment is going to cost you over a million dollars a month. No, I'm sorry. It's going to cost you a million dollars to buy it. A million a month would be out of this world, wouldn't it? It will cost you a million dollars to buy this, this high-rise apartment building in present day modern Jerusalem. So I've decided, I, I, I thought about buying one when I was there, but I thought, no, I'm going to wait on my cubicle mansion in glory. And uh, that will be one that doesn't fade away. So, what or who will be the glory of the new Jerusalem? The remaining verses speak for themselves in verses 22 through 27 as I read this. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now, this is the new Jerusalem. This isn't the millennial temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the true eternal glory of the city is not found in its foundations, not in its pearly gates, uh, not in its golden streets, but the true glory is found in its inhabitants. One of those, the primary one being the Lord God Almighty. Verse 23 says, the glory of God illuminated it. And then you have the Lamb of God who is the light. And then you have all the nations. Verses 24 and 26 say, these nations, they are saved, and they, the kings of the earth, the redeemed, they bring the glory and the honor of their nations into it. So they will, in a sense, be bringing light into the new Jerusalem. I didn't mention this from chapter 21, but it also says there will be no more pain. Now that's nice, isn't it? All light, no pain. I think I ought to mention here, uh, Carol Ann and I had shingles vaccination this past week. Uh, we, should, we thought that was a good idea, uh, not only due to our age, but also our daughter had shingles, and she's like 35 she had shingles this summer, and, and uh, she says, Dad, you don't want to get that. And uh, those of you who have had shingles know what she's talking about. But the, the, the doctor who gave us the shot said that we should avoid uh, particularly pregnant women. So it's not that we can't be in your presence. Uh, just don't go hugging us or shaking our hand. Uh, there, I just saw three young women get up and leave. <laughs> No, we're really, but it is a live vaccine. Uh, just keep your distance, play safe. But now back to the New Jerusalem. It is God and the people of God who will be the glory of the city of God. And according to verse 27, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed to enter this glorious city. Now, in conclusion, I want to ask you this question. Is your name this morning written in the Lamb's book of life? That is the most important question, I believe, that you will be asked from now until Jesus comes. Is your name in the book of the Lamb as one of the redeemed? If you're not sure, you can be sure. In verses 6 through 8, Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, speaks and He says this, to him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. 
But the cowardly, unbelieving, vile, murderous, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Jesus, the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, sacrificed His life to pay the penalty for your sins, my sins. Now He says to you and me, to him who is thirsty, are you thirsty for forgiveness this morning? Are you thirsty for eternal life? Are you thirsty for hope in a seemingly hopeless world this morning? Jesus says, I will give to drink without cost. Without cost to you. It cost him his life. But without cost to you, I will give to him without cost. The spring of the water of life. Spiritually speaking, by faith, you pray and you drink of him by saying, Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I deserve death. You took death from me. I receive your precious gift of forgiveness. I receive you into my life. I accept your gift of eternal life. Folks, it is that simple, but it is that profound. It is eternally life-changing. And just in conclusion, as I was on this trip to Israel, For those of you who already are among the redeemed, there was a missionary man there who just the year before his son, his 17-year-old son, had drowned. There was a precious black lady saint sister there who just the year before, her five grandchildren burned up in a fire in Philadelphia. Did, Did those two saints go to Israel in order to to somehow seek life through that land, through seeing the new or the old Jerusalem, through seeing and praying. No, no. They they went because they wanted to walk on this earth just a short time where Abraham walked, where Jesus walked, to strengthen and encourage them that one day they're going to walk in the new Jerusalem. I trust you are too. Let's pray. Loving God and Father, we just thank You and praise You for Your mercy, Your grace, Your love for us, toward us. Thank You for Jesus who paid the price. Thank You that You have blessed Your children with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. I pray for those who may never have trusted Christ that even this very moment, in their privacy of their hearts, they may be praying to You and putting their faith and trust alone in Your Son, Jesus. Thank You for that which awaits us in glory. We give you the praise in your Son's name. 